you will hate this question, but basically, do you want me to ask you about the RAID 3 or do you want me to ask you about Deathstroke? <laughs> Selamat datang kembali di The Industry, presented to you by OPPO. Sebuah acara mingguan tentang segala hal yang berhubungan dengan industri perfilman, di mana saya, Arifin Putra, ngobrol dengan orang-orang berbakat yang memiliki passion yang sama dengan saya, cinema. So, Without further ado, let's roll! Saya merasa sangat beruntung dan bersyukur pernah mendapat kesempatan dapat berkolaborasi dengan sutradara berikut ini. Ia melihat sesuatu yang menarik dari budaya pencak silat dan ia berhasil memperkenalkan budaya Indonesia tersebut ke seluruh dunia. Ia juga membuka pintu untuk sineas-sineas Indonesia berikutnya untuk mendunia. Siapa dia? Langsung aja kita ngobrol dengan Gareth Evans lewat video call menggunakan OPPO. Hey Gareth, how are you doing? Doing good, my friend. How are you? Long time no see. Very long time no see. It's very good to see you. Although, you know, it's it's just virtually, but hey, I hope you're keeping sane during these uh, uncertain times. Yeah, that's the that seems to be the new norm now, doesn't it? Everything's virtual, everything's on Zoom or some kind of screen sharing thing. But yeah, weather's been pretty good so far, even though we're coming into October and Wales is notorious for a lot of rain, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, I think when you came to visit us, we had okayish weather. I think I can't remember. Do you miss the floods from Jakarta? Um, no, I don't. You know, <laughs> that was certainly not something I miss at all. I saw on your Instagram you're you're kind of prepping for something, something actiony. Yeah. Is is that still for Gangs of London, which we will talk about in a bit, or is it something completely different, or or what is that? So this this is something completely different. I've been developing a feature film that was supposed to shoot in August of this year. Uh, but obviously that changed. And so um, it's kind of been on the back burner for a bit. But we're sort of doing a lot of the sort of soft prep and anything we can do remotely. So, I mean, like Zoom has been, like using Zoom has been really helpful. I've been hooking up with Matt as well. Matt's in LA. Um, and so we've been kind of remotely shot listing the entire film. Um, and so we're doing all the prep work we can uh, and, and it's very much a sort of like hurry up and wait situation at the moment. You know, it's, like, it's like being on the, the running blocks and waiting for the starter pistol to go. So Matt is DPing that as well? Matt will DP it as well, yeah. Yeah, I can't, I can't not work with Matt. Uh, he, he, it's, it's like missing a limb or missing an, a body part, you know? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, I mean, like, when are you two getting married? Because, I mean, it seems like it's definitely... Uh till death do us part kind of deal, isn't it? Well, well that, that's one of the other things you don't realize. I mean, like we, we didn't invite you to the wedding, but um, that, you know, that has happened. Um, <laughs> it already happened. Oh, um, Jesus. I'm not even angry. I'm impressed, man. <laughs> <laughs> the vows were amazing. But um, we've, we've had a, I mean, like, it's, been, it's been weird. It's been surreal um, to kind of prep a film remotely. There's loads of tech out there, which has been really helpful and useful. We've been talking to these guys at um, Dupe, a VFX company that did the, a large portion of the VFX across gangs. And um, they, they've been sort of like working with me on some sort of like, you know, I, I, this is where I come across exactly like my dad explaining computer technology here. So bear with, I am 40 now, so I can get away with that. Um, so they've been setting up doing a thing with where we have like virtual set builds. So we can plug into VR and then take a look at designs of sets and discuss and say, oh, can we have a prac light here or can we change the color of the walls, this, that, and the other. And it's a really, really useful tool to be able to kind of like have, have an oversight of how the film is going to look and what each room and what each little set is going to look like before you get to set and before you start shooting. So the technology has been amazing. I got a truck chase sequence in, in the new film um, and we've been doing this thing where they have kind of taken the GPS coordinates of the location that we want to use for the chase sequence. They've mapped it all out and recreated it in, in sort of Unreal Engine. And then they've what? done an animation of what the trucks would do, what the cars would do. And then I'm here in this little space here with a couple of remote sensors dotted around the room. And basically I've got like a little iPad with a, a puck on the end of it, which picks up on the sensors. And I'm able to shoot a previs, like a, like an actual the the mechanics and movement of the camera. Um, decide, tell them, oh, can you put a camera here, and then they just drop a virtual camera in that space. And then I'm able to do takes of things and see what looks good, what looks bad. But you know, with trucks moving and cars moving and crashes happening, like it's a game changer uh, of a piece of kit. It's unreal. 
uh, terrible pun there, Unreal Engine. But uh, it's um, it's really good, and we've been kind of we've been we've been we've been playing with that. But we've been using that that software, that that technology, and it's been it's been it's been incredible so far. But with that kind of sandbox approach, does that kind of make you burn through your budget even more? Because you know, all of a sudden, you have all of these toys and you're like wow we can do this wow we can do that not really because what it does is it kind of allows me to like i'm not going to go to my producer then and then say oh i'm i need everything in case i need something i can say to him oh i need this specifically for this shot or this specifically for this one sequence for me it's amazing and also the the other thing which is like you know worth its weight in gold is is that i'm able to do multiple car crashes and truck sequences and 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 you know and get lots of different angles and figure out exactly what i want to do and there's no stunts involved no one's in harm's way no, nothing is a risk because it's all just virtual for now i mean it sounds like you're having a ball over there i mean i would love if we had so many tools at our disposal but first of all, I want to congratulate you. Um, it seems that your show Gangs of London is just exploding like crazy. It, it only came out recently, right? But it seems to be doing extremely, extremely well. So first off, congratulations. Thank and you. And secondly, I think you've been working on this for like a long time, haven't you? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the ga Gangs came out in April this year in the UK. So it's going to start to kind of trickle across now. It's, it, it had a big sort of UK push. Um, and, and now, now it comes to go global. Don't know if it'll survive the censorship for Indonesia. To be quite honest with you, um, you know, we didn't hold back on, on the show by any stretch of the imagination. What did you do, Gareth? Um, what and, did and you so, do? So I, I don't. I don't... <laughs> hey, it's not my fault. I, I only directed two of the episodes. You can blame Karen and Xavier for the rest of it. Um, but uh, yeah, no, we had. Um, we, we had a we had a good time making it it was uh, it was it was pretty intense at times and and um you know it was relearning and recalibrating some of the stuff that i would have done in film but trying to pinch and squeeze that within a, a tv budget and schedule which is a lot tighter obviously it was in development for quite a while it took us about i think we were about two years from initial sort of like you know signing on to the project before we got to day one of shooting um, large part of that was because I went off to do Apostle first. Um, and Apostle was kind of like, A, a film that I was desperate to make because I wanted to do something that was completely different from like the Raid films. I wanted to do something that was not within my comfort zone in terms of like it wasn't an action movie. Um, but also, I needed to have that experience of what a shoot day looked like in the UK. Um, I didn't want to jump into, you know, a nine-part TV series without having experienced exactly what one day of shooting looks like in the UK. Because, you know, it's like a day of shooting in Indonesia is a very, very different thing. Um, the mm -hmm. hours are a lot longer. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're there till you finish your scene. We have actual work hours in Indonesia that, that exist? <laughs> I, I, man, I, I, I'll be honest. I mean, like, I, I've always been, you know, I always will be eternally grateful for what I got to experience out there and the way the, what it did for me and my career and everything else and the people I've met and the people I got to work with out there. Um, but I don't miss the hours. I, I really don't miss the hours at all. I mean, I know the Raid 1 and the Raid 2, like they burnt me out, like really burnt me out on a, on a physical level and a mental capacity because you just like, I didn't have time to think about anything else other than what we were doing each day. Uh, it was just insane and, and, and each day lasted a lot longer, you know, so yeah. So in, in the UK then, um, obviously the days are a lot more regimented. And so when you hit the sort of when you're supposed to finish that day, you know, you could maybe ask for 15 minutes or an extra 45 minutes or, or go into overtime by an hour, but you can't make that a habit. You can't, you can't do that every single day and, 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 you know, in order to pick up. So you start to think a bit more economical in terms of, what your shots are, how you're going to execute it, um, what are the things you're going to drop, what are the things you're going to prioritize. Yeah, I, I don't think I could go back to doing 15, 18 hour days anymore. <laughs> so yeah, those days are long gone from my side. I mean, I remember, I remember one day, it, it doesn't really technically classify as a single day because we did a day on, um, on, on the Raid 1. I'd been, I was shooting for about 26 hours. So, you know, it was both the longest day and also the shortest <laughs> day. We were so absolutely drained um, by the end of it. When we called rap and that was it, the film was done and it was all in the can. 
they, it wasn't sort of jubilation. It was just kind of relief. <laughs> we all, we all. I remember us all sitting there, ready to have our photograph taken to see, you know, the sort of like all the crew together. And it was one of those <laughs> photographs where I don't think anyone would have wanted a copy of it because we just all looked just shredded by the experience of it. What actually got you into film, or when did your love for movies start? And is there maybe like one particular movie that kind of got you going? or a certain genre or something like that? I, I, I was always interested in film in some capacity. When I was a kid, I, I always dreamed of being an actor. That was like my, my thing. I wanted to be an actor. And um, <laughs> I grew up watching like, you know, De Niro and Pacino and kind of obsessing with them. And then I very, very, very quickly realized that I couldn't act for shit. And it was that, <laughs> that moment when I was what like, What gave it know, away? What? what gave it away? <laughs> um, just, I think, you know, I didn't have a video camera when I was a kid, you know what I mean? So it wasn't like I had a video camera, like shot myself doing some monologue or some soliloquy and then watching it back and being like, oh God, you know, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like a moment like that. But I just think it just, I just kind of knew that I was too self-conscious about stuff. So I was too aware mm -hmm. of everything I was doing and I couldn't just switch off from that. I, I found out that I was sort of, I was enjoying the process of writing stories. I enjoyed the idea of, seeing a visual and, and, and experiencing a performance more than mm -hmm. creating one, um, more than actually, you know, being, being the person performing. And, um, you know, I grew up watching all sorts of films. My dad was a massive, is a massive film buff and would always bring back like mm -hmm. VHS tapes in the video shop and, you know, we'd rent them out and watch them over the weekends. Um, you know, and all sorts of different films. Like it was never a case of it being just whatever was coming out of America at the time. It was European cinema. It was um, Japanese cinema. It was Hong Kong action cinema, which you know led to my love of martial arts and as a film genre. And you know, Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee and Jet Li and everyone else. And then you know, he got me into hard, uh, hard boiled with John Woo because John Woo was seen as the replacement of Sam Peckinpah, who made The Wild Bunch, which was my father's favorite film of all time. I think that was the initial interest I had. And, and I was in a small village. Like I wasn't living in a big capital city. I wasn't close to the industry in any way, shape or form. Um, but, you know, mm -hmm. I tune in every Christmas on TV to watch things like, you know, America's Greatest Stunts because it would be a glimpse into what the behind the scenes actually looked like on a film. But then when I was, as I was growing up then, I think when I was probably 17 or 18, um, Boogie Nights came out might have been 16, 17, and Boogie Nights came out, and it was in the mm -hmm. cinema, and I went to go see it in the cinema, and I just remember watching that film. It was a packed screen, and everyone was there, and mm -hmm. everyone had been kind of like laughing along with the sort of the more comedic elements of the first hour or 20 or so before it all kind of, you know, starts to go south and becomes more and more like serious and more and more sort of dark. And then I realized we kind of all got swept up with this party atmosphere of the first hour and 20 of that movie and then got completely stunned into silence once it did that turn, that darker turn. And I, and I remember there's one scene in particular when Alfred Molina plays a, a, somebody who's kind of buying drugs off the guys and there's this, um, this kid in the background setting off firecrackers throughout the entire scene. And it was probably like one of the most intense, like tension building moments in, in, in a film that I had seen for a long time. And I just remember being mm -hmm. sat there watching the film and you could hear a pin drop because no one in the audience was doing anything other than being completely transfixed to the screen. And I had a moment where I kind of observed that a little bit. I kind of like I took myself out of the experience for a moment just to observe the fact that everybody else in the screen was exactly the same as me. And I, I, I came away from that film realizing how 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 just the combination of those images those performance beats the sound design the music every aspect of filmmaking could control a large portion of an audience all into the same headspace all into the same like emotional response and so i think that kind of was the thing that pushed me and i was like i want to do this i, I want to try to you know uh create moments like that where a collective group of people who don't know each other can all go on the same journey together. And whether they feel elated, excited, scared, or tense, like, you know, that, that was something that was really important to me. And I was like, I think I, think, I think I can do this. I think I can be part of that. What, what I also 
still remember about you is that you're just very good in communicating as a director. Um, because I mean, a few times I was working with a few directors and um, th they had an idea, but they couldn't really communicate it. But with you, mm. what, what I always found very interesting is that you're just very, very specific and you have a very clear idea of what you want. I think for Matt, your DP, you once actually told him to move the frame by half a centimeter. That's specific <laughs> Maybe not half a centimeter, but you know. <laughs> no, no, no I, I, I remember I was right next to you and you actually said, move it half a centimeter. Um, so, so where does that specificity come from? I mean, like, how do you manage to communicate that well? I think a lot of it, though, comes from knowing the tone of the thing that you're making, knowing what the tone of the scene needs to feel like. And... It's, it's encouraging everyone around you to kind of plug into the same sort of wavelength and, 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 to, and to understand what the tone of the piece is, as opposed mm -hmm. to the alternative, which is dictating every single step and movement of a piece and stuff like that. I think I've mm -hmm. learned more in the last few years with regards to that. And look, I mean, one of the things that I really took from our collaboration when we did The Ray 2 was knowing that I could trust you and I think trust is, is something that goes back and, you know, goes between two people and stuff like that. And I think we had a lot of conversations when we did the Ray 2, you know, you know, mm -hmm. not just prior to shooting, but, you know, almost every day of the shoot. You know, we would talk about the character, remind ourselves where we were in the story, remind ourselves where we were in, in, in the sort of the bigger picture of things. A lot of the time, what I want is is what I'm getting from you guys as performers. It's not something that I have a 100% crystallized vision of from the moment I start writing it to the moment we start making it. it. You know, it changes, it evolves over time. And, you know, there were things about Ucho as a character that we established throughout that performance that, you know, that, that you brought so much to. And, and you know, I, I remember, like, I remember the... I loved that process because I found it really engaging and really involving was when we were doing the scene where you were going to put a bullet in Tio when we were doing the scene when you killed Bangun in the in the office. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember being out there by the monitors and we were kind of going to get ready to set up for the first shot. And then I think I think Dondi might have reached out and asked me, said like, oh, Arifin wants to have a chat about something. I remember coming into the room and then sitting with you and then like, you know, expecting it to be a thing of like you know let's talk about the scene or let's talk about the steps and da 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 and you just hit me with this curveball of do i really want to kill him do i really want to do this thing right now and i was like oh shit i guess you know, and i and i wasn't i wasn't expecting that to be the, the 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 question but it was it was perfect because it allowed it allowed us to kind of explore that headspace more it was important it was important to get you into that headspace because like it wasn't just uh Shot one is you pulling the trigger and shot two is him falling. It was, how do I get you there? How do, you, how do, I, how do I help you find that, that place? And how do you find it then to make it real? Because at the end of the day, we're all coming to set as we are as people. But then the moment you step onto the set, the moment that those cameras start to roll, it's about you believing you are exactly somebody else completely with his own set of um, thoughts and beliefs and opinions, his own way of reacting to things. And so, you know, my job is literally at that point is to try to help you like throw away the sort of the, 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 the facade of it and throw away the illusion of it and find the real in everything. And I think that is the key component of it. And so it's, it's being able to observe what you're doing, understand what you're doing, understand where you're coming from and, and try to sort of like nudge you in, 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 in places that I think could maybe better suit the scene or the character um and embrace and take on board all the things that you bring to it that take it in directions that maybe i'm not expecting but actually end up preferring i think the idea of director as dictator is is complete bullshit and i think that you don't get your best work from your crew and your cast when you treat it like that when you're sort of like oh no i need you to go here and i need you to be on this mark and blah 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 you lose spontaneity and you lose that that sense of things potentially being real but um i mean do you still do like 30 40 fakes Nowhere near, nowhere near as much. Um, so why did we do that many shots? Was that just for kicks or? We never did it so much for drama. Like the drama, we were quite, we were all right. We were quite economical when it came to the drama. The long takes were the martial arts things. The problem is, is that when it's so specific and it's so, 
and and every shot was a jigsaw piece it's like if the shot isn't right it's never right and and because we don't shoot mm-hmm. coverage it's not like you can go back and then be like oh well we've just got to the wide master and then paper over the cracks i think also to be honest i mean when we did the raid one especially we were setting up an infrastructure for the industry there in terms of action cinema you know oh, yeah. we were Oh, yeah. We were we were we were auditioning um, a bunch of people. We like, I know like because back then, prior to doing the raid one, when we were doing the previous, we had um, Icha come over to do casting for us across like you know everyone we could find in terms of a fighter that, that had any kind of martial arts capability, and you know we saw hundreds of people to to try to kind of you know populate this this film, um, and so you know some of them were great. Some of them weren't amazing. And, 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 you know, it's like Eco can be as incredible as he is in terms of his fluidity of movement. But if the person on the receiving end isn't able to match him for pace, energy, impact, power and sell the hits and, and sell the movement and, and is off with the rhythm. It's like a dance. If, if your dance partner is not as good, you don't look that, look that good either. Look, if the take was great on, on take one, I'd have taken it. Um, but it was always about making sure that the shots worked and the action looked good and it had the right impact point for it. Hello everyone, we want to take a quick moment to thank our sponsor Oppo for making the show possible. All video calls and also behind the scenes are shot on Oppo using the Oppo Reno4 Pro. Saya suka banget dengan 3D curve display yang membuat viewing experience menjadi benar-benar jernih sekali. And now, back to our show. I mean, now you're a creator, right? So you basically mm. have to delegate a lot of tasks to other people, but I mean, Back in the day, you were the writer, you were the director, you were the editor on set. <laughs> uh, you were also the producer. You were pretty much a one-man show. Did that help you in making, you know, the action that you did? It's it's weird. It's like I don't feel like anything I've done hasn't already been done before and better in Hong Kong. I feel like the '80s Hong mm-hmm. Kong action cinema f- uh, period was the golden age of action filmmaking. And I think, you know, mm-hmm. like, dude, I, I, I'll, I'll go back and I re-watch those films and it's like film school for action filmmakers. Um, mm-hmm. And, and I, I love watching them. I love seeing the sort of like, oh, okay, the, that shot really sold that impact or, 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 or that, that percussive element of the action is really interesting because it creates rhythms as opposed to being just like, you know, mindless sort of punch, 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 kick, 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 punch, kick, kick, block, block, block. Nothing's really changed that much. I still, I still write and direct. Um, I still edit the action sequences. I have a really good editor here now in Wales who handles the drama stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's amazing. Sarah, her name is. And, and she worked with me across gangs. So she did all the drama work. And then I did the, the action scenes in terms of the, the edits. I still edit on set. That, that's, that's a given. I'm never not going to do that. In terms of my involvement in the choreography, like I can't tell you the mechanics of movement. Mm-hmm. That's for the choreographers to bring to the table because they understand that. So whether it was, you know, Iko and Yayan, who have a life of learning that in Silat, or whether it's um, mm-hmm. Jude Poyer, the stunt coach I'm working with at the moment, and his team. Like, I lean on them because they have that wealth of knowledge. And what I can do is take a look at a sequence and just poke holes at it or question things or, or, or ask if, oh, that's a big hit. Do we need that so early on or could we put that in later? You know what I mean? And, so, and it's more like giving a structure to a fight. So I guess that's where I come in is trying to give a structure to it and try to create that sort of sense of like like a, like a song in a way, the the crescendo moments, the, the the peaks and troughs of it. If every fight scene was just like punchline after punchline after punchline after punchline, if it was just violence after violence after violence after violence, you get sick of it, you get drained of it, you get numb to it. I'll give you these little punchline beats, I'll give you these little moments that make you like <gasps> gasp or catch breath or, or, or some people like laugh in, at the, the sort of the absurdness of it. But um, I'm going to move away from that and then I'm going to show you something else that builds up to something else as opposed to just hitting you with another extremely violent thing. Um, and I think that's always been the, the sort of collaboration between myself and, and the stunt coordinators and the action choreographers um, and so by understanding all the mechanisms, by understanding each little piece of rhythm, um, that allows me then to, to, to find the best way to show that to you as an audience member. But how do you kind of find that right, because you just said the right shot, finding that right shot, right? Because I mean, sometimes you have some crazy ideas about shots, right? It's all sort of like, you know, trial and error. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we're in the previous space and... 
it's just me and the stunt guys and then crash mats and cardboard boxes and it's like there's no no real major time constraints you know yes every day costs a bit of money but it's not the same as being on set costing money where you've got a hundred mm-hmm. plus crew that are getting paid every day so mm-hmm. it, it's um it allows me the flexibility and freedom to fail a lot of times sometimes for piece of choreography the hardest thing is finding out what's the first shot because that first shot will sort of uh, unlock yeah. all the others it's like it's like a chain reaction and so it's almost like if that first shot is wrong then i'll feel it because the next shot isn't allowing me where i want to be next and so it's sort of like it's it's a relationship between all the shots but the 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 thing is is this it's never about finding just like oh what's a cool shot to do it's like what shot will take us into that space and keep the action going because if it's okay. just a cool shot then it's flash and no 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 substance you know that's one thing i that i've always loved about matt is that he will always call me out on the bullshit shots so if i say to him like oh we could do this and we could move the camera here and he could be like yeah but why and if i can't answer him why if there's no sort of like tonal psychological reason for it then it never survives it never it never becomes a shot that we do and we always delete it from the list going back to indonesia because you know this this is for indonesia so indonesian cinema has been actually doing quite well in the last few years yeah. uh, pre pre pandemic times yeah um and obviously in no small part because thanks to you as well uh but i just want to know i mean you also moving to another country now maybe you have a different perspective like what do you think indonesia is still lacking why it cannot like be more global or why doesn't doesn't it capture a more global audience do that is such a thorny question to ask it's why so- not <laughs> Um, you know because you're an outsider so you know an outsider perspective would be nice. Yeah. I think look I think I think it's definitely moving in the right direction. I think you know what the guys doing out there like you know Timo and Kimo and Joko and the guys in Upi and stuff what what they're doing right now is, is amazing. Living in the UK my access to a lot of films is quite difficult. It's harder now, you know what I mean to be able to keep track of the Indonesian film industry when gundala comes out I'll be able to pick that up um I'm excited to check out uh impetigo I'm not I can't remember the Indonesian title for that but it's like you know I I love seeing um Penabdi Setan the like I picked up the mm. the blu-ray from Hong Kong to watch it and loved that mm-hmm. it was amazing you know and, and so so like, there's great great films that are still coming out that are sort of like that do have international appeal um so I think all of that stuff's going in the right direction um you know I loved uh Malina the murder in four chapters the uh, Moli Surya's film I thought that was phenomenal like you know I I saw that I saw that in the cinema here in UK so you know what I mean mm-hmm. like in terms of that like there are definitely films being made that are that are traveling that are doing well you know that 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 are hitting uh, international audiences as well as local I think you know when I was in Indonesia like there was a sort of like a there was a sort of mindset a lot of the time among some producers and and studios out there to be like what's popular let's replicate it but let's replicate it on the cheap and then let's churn out a hundred of them and i think mm-hmm. the problem sometimes i think is oversaturation of the market and i think i think that's mm-hmm. that's the risk i think that's the worry i think it's when because of that oversaturation it led to you know projects and films that maybe should have had a bit more money thrown at them and a bit more time thrown at them um as opposed to like a studio saying the 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 cinema go and audience loves sex comedies let's make 10 of them in the next 6 months and it's like what if you just made two that were great because what you don't want is the audience go into a cinema and then seeing something that has the same quality as something they could have just watched on television for free because there's got to be an incentive to go out to the big screen and watch something huge and that's why i feel like what well, what joko is trying to do right now with the bumilang universe and then the you know and and create in content that can be big and epic and exciting and 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 thrilling and and something for kids to to go out and and be hungry to go and see dude i mean like you know it's like if you just put that down on a piece of paper as a business plan it makes sense but you know it takes filmmakers like joko who has a care for that craft who has a care for you know the look of every shot and the sort of the you know, the, the the performance of every actor to kind of steer that ship in the right direction. I I I love and look forward to seeing 
you know, people sending me clips of stuff that they're doing. Like, you know, uh, you know, every now and then a kid will send me some video that they're doing of some fight scene or something or other that they've just shot on their phones. And you will actually reply to that? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. Uh, or, or, or like, or, or at least click like on something or other or respond to it. Because, dude, I mean, like when I was a kid growing up, I had no access into this industry. I had no way of communicating mm. with a filmmaker or within the industry. And, you know, it exists right now. And it's like, there's an opportunity through the social media platforms to be able to to have that kind of communication and back and forth. Um, but you know, if I see something and it's like, and 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 I, and I think that like I can see that that person's put an awful lot of time and, and effort and, and passion into it, no matter what the budget range, no matter how polished or unpolished it is, you've got to give kudos to that, and you've got to you've got you've got to make people feel like you know that it's it's worth their while to keep pursuing it. And and I think that you know that's that's our responsibility as filmmakers, you know. Who are who are not twenty year olds anymore, <laughs> and um, uh, you know, and and you know, I I I'm enjoying what I do right now, but I I, I you know, I know at some point, probably in the next ten to fifteen years, I'm going to be too tired to kind of run around with a camera doing previews, and I'm I'm going to want those people to kind of come on board and work with me, and then be like, oh, this is the shot I'm thinking of. <laughs> Can you go and do it? My bones are too tired. <laughs> But would you ever consider of doing like another feature or a TV series in Indonesia, or you're like you're very happy where you are right now? Never say never is the answer to that. I, I you know, Justin I do Bieber. feel. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I didn't think today I'd be doing a quote from him, but yeah, go on, why not? Um, <laughs> like I, I would say, um, for me, I. I'm really happy where I am right now and yeah. um, and I'm trying to build something here, like an infrastructure here in Wales. Uh, I could have I could have gone any I could have gone elsewhere. I could have travelled to LA, I could have travelled to London, but I chose to come back to Wales. And and, and mm. you know, it's like as much as I absolutely adored my time in Indonesia and the work I got to do out there, you know, there was always a part of me that was like I never made it in my own country. Like I never made it back here in the UK, like in Wales, you know what I mean? And, and, yeah. and I always felt like I didn't push myself enough in the industry here in Wales. Like, you know, it's not that the industry failed me. It was me not really, you know, putting myself out there enough. And so I, I feel like I've got a responsibility to kind of like to, to, to utilize this time now and, and the sort of the, the opportunities that I have uh, in, in order to kind of like maybe build something here in Wales. But, you know, all that being said, um, I'd love to come back out to Indonesia someday and do a film as well. And, you know, I know I had ideas for projects that were very specifically, you know, Indonesian set, um, whether they are projects I can still get ahead and make. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to sort of um, reunite with Iko and Yayan and the boys at some point uh, and find something that, that we can all do. Um, you know, likewise, I'd love to be able to bring you over here sometime. And then yeah, I was just find saying. I mean, like, I'm why? Why am I being left out of this conversation here? I mean, like, I'm sad. <laughs> I just brought you into it, man. You know, before you said anything, but you know, it's like I had a great time working on all those projects, and and I think that you know, there there there'll be times where all of our path, paths will cross again at some point. I, I'm I'm almost certain of it. And on that note, I mean, you will hate this question but basically do you want me to ask you about the raid 3 or do you want me to ask you about deathstroke <laughs> oh fuck um, <laughs> <laughs> i don't mind doing both I'll, I'll cover both because whichever one we cover on this one my dms or my the comments will end up asking me about the other anyway um look i <laughs> when it comes to deathstroke which is the quicker answer uh, I got approached by about it. Um, I didn't 100% know a lot about the character at the time, so I did a deep dive mm -hmm. and started reading a bunch of materials. Uh, thought it was cool. I had a cool concept idea for a sort of like a really lean, like, you know, nothing more than 100 minutes uh, origin story that would feel really kind of like within the vein of the sort of the Korean noir films that I was watching at the time and um, really into. And... And so I was like, oh, okay, I can do something with this and, and, and make something kind of cool with it. I spoke to the guys at uh, DC about it and, and they, were, they were into it. They, were, they, were, they, they, they liked the concept. And I spoke to Joe, who was supposed to be playing the lead at that time. And then I think, I think Justice League came out. Um, and then I think there was a change of personnel 
and then suddenly Deathstroke stopped being the priority project for them. And so mm. I think they were trying to reconfigure things and then see if they could go in a different direction with some of the projects or whatever, or tonally shift things. And so then in the end, I found myself in a position where, uh, with Deathstroke, where uh, it just kind of fell by the wayside and then, you know, didn't have any follow up. And so I was kind of like, oh, okay, I guess this is just not happening now. And so, th- and that's just really where it's been since then. So it's kind of just like hung in the ether somewhere. And then um, with the Raid 3, I had every intention of making it. Um, and I had an idea and a storyline for it that I've, that I've spoken about in the past. Um, it was going to follow on immediately from the end of the Raid 2, if not go a little bit earlier in the, the timeline of that movie. Mm-hmm. And it was going to be more about the Japanese Yakuza characters as opposed to about Rama. So it was going to be a detour. And it was going to be about the the, the the Yakuza characters being under attack, really, from their own headquarters in Tokyo, but sending a kill squad over to Jakarta. And uh, because because they've started messing with the cops and the politicians in a country that's not their own, it's it's seen as a sort of like, you know, wipe them out and get rid of them. And then the, the idea was that they were going to put in uh, Kazuki's character in as a sort of de facto boss if he, if he gave up uh, Goto and his son. And so what happens is, is that the, the, the kill squad fail in their attempt to kind of like to, to get him. And then um, and basically uh, they end up going into hiding in the jungles of like West Java. And it was going to I was going to try to kind of cast maybe try to get Christine Hakim to kind of be in it as this sort of like matriarchal mob boss that lives out in the jungle. And she has like a sort of like you know, oh, yeah. lots of kids that kind of fight for her and kill for her. And it would have been pretty cool. It would have been a really fun little sort of like different type of movie. You know, this Japanese yeah. kill squad suddenly having to negotiate their way through the jungle instead of like an urban city of concrete. And yeah, I had the idea all set for it, but it, it was one of those things where enough time had passed. Um, I, I went on to do other projects and then they took those projects, took me away from Indonesia. And not only that time took me away from the idea. And it just felt like one of those things where I felt like the second one had ended so well and I know some people say it's a cliffhanger, but I never really thought of it as a cliffhanger. I always felt it was pretty definitive when Iko says, I'm done. It's like, that's him, you know, literally saying it's over, you know? So for me, it was, um, it, it was, it was, it was quite clearly the end of the line, really, in terms of his story. Um, and, and so, so I never really had any ambition to kind of go back and, and do more with it. Fair. I, I had to ask the question because even I, uh, still get that question like all the time like hey what about Ray 3 what about Ray 3 I'm like hey I'm not the director I don't know man <laughs> don't ask me <laughs> thank you so much for your time today um, I, I know you have a lot of things that you need to take care of like two, not shows, so good. two shows and all that stuff so <laughs> thank you so much for today uh, and stay healthy over there stay sane and um, looking forward to eventually seeing Gangs of London at some point I'll send you a Blu-ray I'll take it. All right, cool. <laughs> okay, man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, um, and um, I'll see you when I see you at some point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll sort out something. Either you come here or I go there. We find a way. Bye. Bye, man. Take care. Bye. Itu dia. Gareth Evans. Si perfeksionis yang keliling dunia untuk memperkenalkan budaya Indonesia. Dan sekarang akhirnya pulang kampung untuk memperkenalkan budayanya sendiri. Semoga sukses selalu. And thank you for coming on the show. Kalau kalian suka episode kali ini, like, subscribe. Dan kalau ada komentar tambahan atau pertanyaan, langsung tulis di bawah. Dan supaya kalian tidak ketinggalan episode selanjutnya dari The Industry, presented to you by Oppo, klik tombol lonceng. And that's it for today. Thank you to all cinema heads out there. Stay safe, stay healthy, and most importantly, wash your hands. And that's a wrap. <laughs>